tonight we have a situation where Zach Danziger got caught up in Madrid. He couldn't get a flight. According to my friend Dorino, he heard people in the audience in German going, this drummer is terrible. I got into drumming because I had family. My parents were uh, in the music business. My mom was a singer. My father played piano. So as a very young kid, I would uh, go watch my mom and dad perform at nightclubs. You know, as a three and a four year old, I don't know how they let me in these clubs, but they did. And, um, you know, I guess as an impressionable young kid and seeing your parents on stage, uh, you know, ironically, I was more impressed with the drummer than my father who was playing piano or my mom who was singing. But no doubt about it, that influenced me into wanting to get into music. In the highest sense. I think what happens is you start to like too many things. You know what I mean? You start to have too many influences. Drumming-wise, music-wise, just life experience-wise, things come into your, you know, into your orbit and you, and you just you know, unless you're pushing them away, you can't help but have them make you the person you are. You know, and that comes to say, how does one become the human being that they become? You develop and you, there's just more that happens to you in your life and you draw from that. And, you know, that, you know, happens on a musical level for people if you don't resist it. Some people shut themselves off, they learn what they want to learn, and they stop in a way. You know what I mean? They don't keep searching. I just have to find something new for me to get excited about. And you start grabbing different things in different ratios from different inspirational points of, of reference and you start to get your own sound. What really struck me was his sound, uh, which has evolved over the years. Uh, he came out with this electronics rig both of like sampled drums, but just the way his drums were mic'd and these huge like monitors like on each side of him and just the precision in which he played. And that was in a bigger venue, but then I would go watch him play in smaller clubs and he'd bring a smaller version of this rig with microphones and just like, never had I heard like a bass drum sound so good in a club that held like, you know, 80 people. There's something called latency. Latency is when you hit a surface and you hear the sound, the, the, the time it takes for you to strike it and hear it. Um, you could say though, if you hit a kick drum and the sound is going away from you, for it to come back around in your ear or something, there's probably some latency there as well. It's not immediate. If you put your ear right up to the snare drum like that, that's gonna be much more immediate. But back in the early days of laptops and trying to like trigger things, and not only dealing with latency, but dealing with the fact that the computer would start to like make noises and crackle and you know, you're hearing like <laughs> as you're hitting something because it's having some problems, you know, trying to keep up with what you're doing. Those are the times where you'd be like, mm, the technology's not there yet or this software is not letting me do it in the way I want to. Let's not do this yet. We're not there, you know, so forward now to where we are now. I'm not asking too much anymore, it works, you know, and it could still probably be even a little quicker or, you know, allow you to have more samples in memory, perhaps, but I'll, I'll be okay right now for the 25 to 35%. So it's getting better, all this stuff is uh, working better, which allows me to do what I'm doing, you know, a lot easier. What do you think of the long stems on that uh, bouquet? Thin. Yeah. I actually do love graphics and graphic design and, you know, uh, always loved like messing around with video editing things and, you know, just for fun it's at the top. I had a band called Boomish and we used to sample a lot of audio things and I had a videotape of old game shows that I'd recorded and I grabbed the audio of funny sounds and funny moments from the game shows, made a, a track on an album of the group Boomish and then I thought, hey, it could be fun to find those samples again, but take the video now. And then said, wow, this adds another dimension to the musical experience to see, even if it's not what you're hearing, but just to see anything, you know? There was a part of me that thought, what can one do to give somebody who sees a show a little more than just a guy playing their instrument? Could we go further? What, what can we do to go further that someone goes and sees it and goes, wow, I'm being entertained, you know, on multiple levels here. Fascinating. 
I would say 100% of the time, a couple of things surprise me in a bad way on stage. Sometimes things really fail, where like the computer crashes and there's nothing you can do. You have to restart. So how do you deal with this? You, you hope and you pray it doesn't happen. And you hope that you've done enough shows where enough people have seen you do it successfully. Fascinating. If you put samples on your drums and you want them to sound a little bit more interactive or organic, one way I would do it is I would do what they call multi-sampling of something. So when you hit at a certain velocity, you get less attack or you get a, a, a quieter hit of a, of a sample or ghost note. Like if you, if you want to take this like processed breakbeat and grab like a, you know, an accented snare out of that and you only have that one sample, if you hit it at low volumes, you're still going to get like a loud type hit, but just at a soft volume, it's not going to sound maybe what you want. But maybe in that breakbeat, there are little ghost notes in that breakbeat that you can also sample. And then you say, okay, when I hit quietly on the snare, give me one of the ghost note samples. When I hit loud, give me the louder hit. So now your electronics sound like they're living and breathing. I mean, that's just one example. What happened for me was I got so into drum and bass music. I think a lot of times people would grab certain breakbeats. And since it was a harder process to really customize, if you wanted to get it at a certain tempo, you'd have the whole four bar break. And if you need it faster, you tune it, you just pitch it all up. So when you pitch it all up, all the drums and cymbals sound like they're smaller, you know, the Mickey Mouse effect. So I realized that that was the sound I wanted when I was starting to play drums, recreating drum and bass. So that's when I came to Zildjian and said, can we maybe try to make some cymbals that really recreate what these process samples sound like? The genre of music was pretty new at the time, let alone somebody trying to make cymbals that sounded like that. There are many, many cymbals now that achieve what we set out to do with, with the remix line. But I also then years later helped them with uh, the Karop line and the Avidas line. So I've kind of been in there with them a little bit on a lot of, a lot of their designs. I was fortunate to get to play with Wayne Krantz right at the point where we were working together in Lenny Stern, a guitar player, her quartet was two guitars and bass and myself, uh, and Wayne was one of the guitar players. And I just thought Wayne was like so rhythmically and phrasing wise exactly where my head was at when we used to play together. I think we rehearsed for months and months and months, maybe once a week, maybe twice a week, I can't remember, where he'd bring in maybe one or two sections of one tune he was working on and he wanted to hear it and he wanted to have the drums and the guitar interact in a certain way where it wasn't total like you know counterpoint but wasn't total unison it was selectively both in different time in different ways and i'd play things and he'd be so specific he'd be like first three bars sound great but the fourth time you play that I'm just hearing it only on the ride and don't hit a snare drum on beat three and move it to uh, two and. I'm like, okay, wouldn't think of that. And I'm making these notes on these charts. And that album turned into the album called Long To Be Loose. A, um, people asked if it was improvised. I don't know the album as well as I did when I was making it, but I wanna say like, sure, there are tons of improvisational sections in that music, but there are tons that are I'm almost playing things that I wrote out note for note because he had such a vision that like, just don't hit the floor, Tommy, or whatever you do. And I, I, you know, I'm like, okay, you know. And there was a method to the madness. It wasn't just a, hey, don't do that. No, he, had a, he really had a, a vision. Wayne was probably the most like visioned, unique artist that I was on the ground floor with in seeing him build what came to be someone that has his own style as much as anyone I've ever heard. How did he know that? Okay, so to address the question, so what happened, I have a good friend of mine, Dorino Goldbrunner, a great drummer. Uh, we'd hang out when I was in Munich all the time. He's from Munich. He goes, you know, if you want to wear this old pair of my grandfather's lederhosen, it turned into, I'm pretty much wearing a full-on outfit. A lot of the people who come know that I'm the drummer 
or maybe coming because I'm the drummer. I don't know. Um, you know, they, they're expecting. It's not like I'm playing with uh, Beyonce. You don't care. You just care that it's Beyonce. It's Ori Kane Bedrock, which me, Tim Lafave, and Ori people know that we're in this thing. We're going to tell the the person who was booking the club, who announces the band, would she mind to get on the microphone and say, tonight we have a situation where Zach Danziger got caught up in Madrid. He couldn't get a flight. So we, last minute, we hired a local drummer from Rosenheim. And I think even before the woman made the announcement, I got on stage with the leader hose and the whole thing, and I'm purposely grabbing like, you know, the charts, the sheet music, and going up to Tim, the bass player, and Uri, like, with a pen in my hand and pointing like, is this what, like looking confused. I played in a way that I looked like I wasn't sure of myself. Maybe, I don't remember, I might have missed an ending or two on purpose. I'll never know the truth of what happened, but according to my friend Dorino, he heard people in the audience in German going, this drummer is terrible. Where's Zach? How could they hire this guy? He, he's terrible, you know? And. Um, there was a reviewer there who the next day in the newspaper wrote a review. And I don't know to this day if the reviewer knew about the joke and pretended he didn't, but he said the local drummer filled in for Zach and he looked unsure, but he wasn't bad. He did okay, he made a couple of mistakes. Last time I was there, the woman who was booking the place said, we want to bring you back here. Like they were having a 40th or 50th anniversary of the club. They said, we want to hire you as Josef Rodlisberger to come in with an all-star band, bring whoever you want, and we want to make this a special night. It was a couple of years back. As it turns out, that person does not manage the club anymore. And I didn't call back and say, let's do it, because I was a little confused, did I want to do this or not? But yes, uh, long story, yes, I did. I was uh, Josef Rotlisberger for one evening.